paid me the fault you there. Very welcome here this evening to the library here, county library here at Tallaght. And uh, we have uh, Frank with us tonight there, who's, who's known as Frank Tracy. He's been with us before. He, he's got to be with us on many occasions again for other lectures on, on subjects. A couple of them we've been planning with Anne just before uh, this lecture here tonight. So uh, a couple of things to remind you of. Housekeeping, just if you knock off your, your mobile phones or put them on silent. The trip to the Little Dublin Museum was brilliant. It wasn't on myself, but all reports coming back and all reviews of it are really, really excellent and good. Uh, no questions until the lecture is over, please. Frank will deal with, uh, he'll bat away all the uh, questions after that, no problem. He'll return service without any problem whatsoever at all. And uh, Frank is going to take it away there about uh, the, uh, the Massey estate. Thanks very much, uh, Chairman. So this very topical because Massey's is all the talk at the moment. Massey's in the health work club and there's all kinds of exotic plans for the disunification of the health work club. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the Massey family. How I got on to this was that as a young lad growing up in the Liberties, can you all hear me, you can? Yeah. Yeah. As a young lad growing up in the Liberties, I was in the, the Scouts, uh, the Boy Scouts as it then was, it's gone all mixed now. And uh, we were very restricted as to where we could go because we could get the bus to that farm or Enniskerry or Rockbrook or Tallaght. And Rockbrook would lead you into the Massey estate. And this was back in the 50s. The house was gone, but the basements were still there. And in the 50s, uh, the Second World War was all the thing for games, you know, shooting and fighting and things. So we used to hold battles in the basements, popping up and down and shooting and so on. And I remember one day seeing this elderly man standing looking at us. And we waved to him and he waved to us and he went off. And the scout leader said to us afterwards that that was Lord Massey and that he lived in a little cottage across the way and that he used to own all this land, but it was all gone now, lost. And even as a youngster, <coughs> I remember the kind of poignancy and the sadness of the man, you know, just going off. So when I retired and the wife wanted me out of the house, I had to find things to do. Even now, she said to me, like yesterday, I went to Galway just for the crack in the free <laughs> travel. But it can be, so, but she'll say to me some evenings, have you anything on tomorrow? No. And she said, well, why don't you go somewhere? <laughs> so, uh, I'm a I lucky, I suppose. But anyway, when I retired, I started doing a bit of writing and um, talking and, and so on. And uh, the first uh, book I did was the one on, on the Massies, that little one there which you can get. I'm told, I gave that away to the, I'm not interested in, in publication or money or anything else. So I came in here uh, 10 years ago, I think, and I, I showed them the typescript of that. And I said, if, if you're willing to publish that, you can have it. And they tell me they've sold over 10,000 of them since. Made quite a lot of money. So um, it's still there. I think I'm running near the end of it. But anyway, it's still there. So um, it took me three years because everyone knew the name Massey's Wood, full stop. Nobody knew anything after that. And I set off to find out who the Massey's were. And what we're going to talk about tonight is the whole story of what unraveled. And the first thing is the name. I traced them back to Normandy before the, the Norman conquest in England, William the Conqueror. And they lived in the same area as William the Conqueror, and there were knights there, and their name was De Massey, D-E-M-A-S-C-I. And a load of them come over under a guy called Hammond de Massey. And that name is in the family right down to the present day, Hammond de Massey. And they knocked a few heads together in England for William the Conqueror, for which they got half of Cheshire. So most Masseys in the world will trace their origins back to Cheshire. Now it's very difficult to go beyond that into Normandy. So in England, people phonetically spelled the name Massey, M-A-S-S-E-Y. And for a while, like Norman names here, they kept the D-E, the Massey, but then they dropped that. And the name became Massey, M-A-S-S-E-Y. 
And then one family and one family alone spells it Massey, M-A-S-S-Y. And we'll come to that in a minute, how that came about. So, they, when they came to England and they got a big chunk of Cheshire, they built an estate, and like um, many a town in Ireland, they called the local town after themselves, they called it Dunham Massey, and that's the Dunham Massey estate. Now, the Battle of Hastings ended when King Harold of England got an arrow in the eye. You see it there in the Bay or Tapestry? And that meant that William had won, because once you got the big fella, uh, that was it. So the Masseys were given vast estates in Cheshire, and the head guy, um, Hammond, was given uh, the Dunham Massey estate, and 13 successive generations lived there. And the head of each generation was called Hammond, Hammond the Massey. And they also had a title, uh, Baron Massey of Duntree. So that's the English side of it. The house is still there. It's in the National Trust. The Masseys over there have kind of petered out. It went into female line and then petered out. But it's near uh, uh, Altrigham, near Manchester. And you can go there for a day out. It's a lovely day out and walk around the house and so on. So that's where they came from. Now one of them, one of them, and they're, they're all over Cheshire, and myself, I, I, I have satisfied myself that this guy came from a townland called Coddington, because there are masses all over Cheshire, but Coddington is the one with the, the most hues in it, H-U-G-H, Hugh Massey. So I'm satisfied that he, he was one of them. He came over with Cromwell in 1641, and the Cromwellians kept meticulous records. And from the very beginning, the name is spelled M-A-S-S-Y. Now, whether it was a mistake that he lived with, or whether he decided to spell it M-A-S-S-Y, anyone with the name M-A-S-S-Y is a descendant of that man, because all the others are E-Y. And Massey's get in touch with me from all over the world wanting to know their origins, and the first thing I need to know is how they spell their name. And if it's E-Y, I say go to Cheshire, go to Chester. If it's why, I find it uh, in there. It happens with my name. My name is T-R-A-C-Y. And why say is hotel receptions or any kind of bureaucracy or whatever, Tracy without an E. Nine out of ten can't deal with that. <laughs> they, look, they have to say T-R-A-C-Y. Because if I say Tracy without an E, you get this hesitation. And nine out of ten times, they're compelled to put an E in somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Anyway, this is where... Now, I had one talk uh, some while back on this. I went through what I've just given to you. And at the end of the talk, the first question was a lady who said, you spelled the name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, isn't it? Like, say, uh, but don't ask that question. <laughs> anyway, Cromwell come over. He, he had beheaded Charles II, and uh, Charles II was beheaded because he blew all the money Charles in the treasury. Charles the First. Charles the First. Charles the First, right. Yes. Oh, you're right, yeah. Well, you have to be up early here. <laughs> uh, he's incidental. But anyway, Charles the First. Uh, we'll come to this to Charles II later. That, um, anyway, he had no money, so the only way he could pay his army was to give them land. So he started allocating land that belonged to other people. Now this made no difference to the peasants, because all it meant for me is that instead of paying my rent to you, I now paid it to him. So it didn't have much impact at that level. Now, for the guys that owned the land, they had to hell or to Connacht or bugger off, go somewhere else, you know? Uh, so it was a huge upheaval. And Hugh Massey got land in Limerick. He was a captain of cavalry, and he was allocated 3,055 acres at three locations in County Limerick. Uh, the biggest one was Duntraleague near Galvalley. And there is the map of Duntraleague there, with all the measurements of the fields and so on. And he built a mansion on it, and his son built a church on it. 
So you see it there. Uh, so that's the start of it. Uh, 3,055 acres. Uh, his son travelled the Massey land holdings. Now how you did that was quite simple. <coughs> All these guys were English and they came over here. But most of them had no interest in staying here and had no interest in land. So, I get a lump of land, you get a lump of land, you get a lump of land. You. You're not interested in staying, so I said, well, I'll give you extras. Cheap. Right. <coughs> so they started bartering the land. So most of them went home. But the masses stayed. Now, all each generation, the eldest son is Hugh. <coughs> so to distinguish it, I'm saying Q1, Q2, Q3, and so on, just to make it easy. So he travelled the land, holding, he built the church at Duntraleague, and he's buried under the bell tower. Now there's what's left of the church in Duntraleague. And your man from the 1600s is buried under the bell tower. This building here will come to later, okay? Just put it in the back of your head. Now, that's 1641. Um, onwards. Now, in 1685, Charles II died, and James II took over the crown. Now, the importance of that is it moved from Protestant to Catholic. So the Catholics are now. So all hell breaks loose in Ireland as the Catholics who've been dumped out say, "This is our chance now to dump the lads." So all kinds of atrocities occur, which we don't like to acknowledge, because it doesn't suit the dialogue. And that lasted until 1690, when William of Orange came over and sorted us out again, just like Cromwell, to be sure, to be sure, came back up. But in that interim period, it was a dangerous place for planters to be. And a lot of families, including the Masseys, sent their women folk back to England. <coughs> And when it all was sorted out in 1690, the Massey women came back. Now, Elizabeth Massey had married a man named Irby. His surname was Irby, and he was the vicar of that church in Duntraleaf. So she was now Elizabeth Irby. And when she came back, she commissioned this chalice, which is still there in uh, the, the Protestant Archbishop of Cashel, keeps it safe. And that engraving on the chalice says, this chalice was given by Elizabeth Derby to ye church at Duntraleague in the Kingdom of Ireland as a grateful acknowledgement to Almighty God for her safe return to her native country and finding her husband and father, you too, in good health, which mercy she hopes never to forget. Now the interesting thing about that is that not a wet day in the place and she's talking about her country, return to her native country. Isn't that interesting? Because the, promise, the, the, the problem for the ascendancy all along is which country. You know, they never really sorted that one out and that contributed to their end. So that chalice is still there and that was done in 1690. <coughs> now we now move to Hugh three, And I try to be positive. <laughs> this guy was a strenuous advocate of the Reformation and a rabid anti papist he had a reputation for constant entertaining, gambling and dueling. He mortgaged all the family holdings and he died in 1757 after a long, tedious illness, <laughs> at which stage they were broke. They still had the land and they still had the house, but everything was mortgaged. The loans coming out their ears. Now that will be sorted out later. So that's Q3. His son became the first Baron Massey. And that's him there. Now the thing about all these portraits, these portraits are not of great quality. They're like um, uh, photographs that you get taken for your family at communion or uh, whatever. They're not of great merit, but they're nice photographs. So they were, they were kind of working artists. They went around from house to house and would paint the people. So they're not of great merit. But what happens to a lot of them now is that they turn up in auctions and they're bought in lots 
and they end up in hotel lobbies or whatever. And they fit in, but nobody knows who bloody hell they are. And the first thing I do when I go into a hotel where there's portraits like that is look at the back. Because nine times out of ten, who they are is written on the back. Now, you wouldn't believe the trouble I had to go to find these portraits. But that's the first Baron Massey, and he was made Baron Massey in 1776, and he died in 1788 at 80 years of age. <coughs> he picked this uh, armorial here, <coughs> and the logo is for the freedom of our country. But the problem was which country? <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth Bowen, who was of the Ascendancy and wrote one of the finest books on the life of the Ascendancy, she reckoned that the only place they really knew where they were and felt comfortable was the middle of the Irish Sea. Because in Ireland they were English, and in England they were Irish. And they, they, they had that problem right up to the end. Now, the first Baron Massey built this second house in the Galtee Mountains. Uh, Massey Lodge, and that's one of only two of the houses which are still there today. That's in the hands of a farmer, and you wouldn't believe what he's done to us. Each I wouldn't describe it, you know, no appreciation, whatever. And it's a lovely house, but he bought it, uh, his father bought it cheap. And uh, anyway, that's Massey Lodge. So now we have a big house in Duntree, and we have Massey Lodge. Now the first Baron had a brother, and I just put this up here just to show you, he was an extraordinary character, Air Massey, you know the spelling, I'll come to that in a minute. Air Massey saw action in the War of Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War. He was with the British forces that captured Portobello in Panama. He was wounded at the Battle of Culloden. Go to the geography of this now in your head. Mm -hmm. uh, he was with the British forces that invaded Canada and captured Quebec. As Major General, he commanded British forces in Nova Scotia. He was appointed Marshal of the British Army in Ireland. He was created Baron in 1800, taking the title Lord Clarina, and the title became extinct in 1952 at the death of the sixth Baron. There were no more males in the family. <coughs> to distinguish himself from his brother, uh, Lord Massey, he put the E back into his name. But it's not a problem because there's none of them around now. We know who they all were and they became extinct in 1952. Now, so we have the first Baron, he died in 1788. His son took the title in 1788. He only had it for two years, but he was very important because he married an heiress and he cleared all the debts, all gone. And although he barred the Massey just for two years, extremely important, the trick is to marry an heiress. <laughs> <laughs> so they're now back in business, all debts, all debts cleared. Now, his son, the third Baron, we're moving at a pace because when we come into our lifetime, it gets quite interesting. He voted against the Act of Union and was one of only three lords who voted against the Act of Union <coughs> because he said it would be the ruination of them, which it was. It was the start of the end. He purchased a new estate, Hermitage, and eight and a half thousand acres at Castle Connell on the River Shannon. And he built the chancel house at Duntrelee. Remember I said, you see that thing at the side of the old church? Well, that's a charnel house. There's the house he bought in Castle Connell. Mm -hmm. Hermitage. So that became the seat of the masses. And that sat on eight and a half thousand of the finest land uh, overlooking the River Shannon. There's that charnel house, and there's 26 masses over five generations in there, in their columns. And I traced who they all were. So you can give Sheila five euro for the book and you can get them all. And there's uh, 26 of them. In there, including the man who built it, the third baron. They won't be there an awful lot longer because that's falling asunder and eventually I think they'll all be put on the ground because I can't see the county council restoring that. Maybe they will, 
I don't know. But if you climb up on top of that there, when the coffin would come, you put on top of what looked like an altar there, and they'd hold their ceremony. But at the moment, if you climb up there, you can look in there, and you see all the coffins. Now, I'll tell you about a few of them. Um, Hugh Fitzjohn Massey and Francis Inglesby, 1743. The ascendancy operated the system of primogenitor. The eldest son got the lot. Now, the others had to be looked after by way of allowances. And one of the problems over generations is that they became heavily encumbered. <coughs> now, <coughs> Prince Charles has that problem now at the moment. And he says he's not going to be as generous as his mother. Because the Queen, apart from her own salary, she lives off the Duchy of Lanchester, Lancaster. Charles lives, lives off the Duchy of Cornwall the rents and so on. Now from that, she has to look after all her relatives. Now her father had a number of um, George the six number of uh, brothers and sisters, and their children are now the Duke and Duchess of Kent, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, uh, <coughs> there's a few others, and they all have to get an allowance. <coughs> and then there's her children, Anne and Edward and Andrew. And their children. And now there's grandchildren. And now there's great grandchildren. The Charles has signaled that he's having one back. <laughs> <laughs> Tighten up when, when he gets in, you know. So they've all this money to pay out. And a lot of these people had huge amounts of money to pay out to different people in the family before they got anything themselves. Now, the people who didn't get the title, one of the, the ways of occupying themselves, one the big popular one was to join the British Army, because you'd go in as a captain or whatever and walk away. The other one was to join the church, the, the Church of England, the Church of Ireland, and you would move upwards. Now this guy, Fitzjohn Massey, he invented another way. You kidnap an heiress. <laughs> and in the library here you get a book, The Abduction of a Limerick Heiress. And that's the story of Hugh Fitzjohn Massey and Francis Inglesby. Francis Inglesby inherited a huge dollop of County Limerick. But she was very flighty and, and not reliable, so she had to be kept on the close guard. She, she was staying with an uncle who was a vicar, and a very door vicar, in a little place called Nantonin in County Limerick. You wouldn't be able to find it. But Fitzjohn Massey arrived one night with a number of his pals and knocked on the door and said to them truth that his horse had thrown him and that he was injured and could he come in. So they let him in and the lads come in. Whereupon they, they kidnapped Francis Indian. Now the accounts how she was under such constraints, it is said that she didn't put up much resistance. A bit of adventure, somewhere to go. So off they went. And a huge sum of money was put on his head. He went initially to Dunsley and then he went to France. Uh, there was a huge sum of money on his head. He came back after uh, some time and she was pregnant. Okay? Now, the problem there was she was now damaged goods. She had no future. No future. So her best bet was to stick with bitch John Massey, whom she liked. So she wouldn't give evidence against him. She wouldn't admit anything, with the result that he got off. And in those days, the husband inherited all the money. They got married, and Fitzjohn Massey got all her money, and by all accounts, they lived happy ever after. <laughs> Archdeacon George Dirty Boots Massey, <laughs> a vicar in Limerick, and a vacancy come up for the Archdeacon of Limerick. Now in those days, the Church of Ireland was established. It was a government department. It became disestablished in 1860. But in those days it was established, it was a government department. So you have to apply when the job came up. He applied, he was called for interview. On the stage coach to Dublin, he wasn't a very talkative man, but there was another vicar who was all talk and who let slip that he was going to Dublin for this job as Archdeacon. Of Limerick. So Massey took note of that. But the minute the stagecoach arrived, 
The other man went off to his hotel to polish himself up and so on. Massey went straight to the castle, got an interview, and got the job. And on the way out, he met the other fellow coming in, all washed and polished. <laughs> and the other fellow was told they were very sorry, but the job had already gone to dirty boots there. <laughs> the and uh, Massey reveled for the rest of his life in the name Dirty Boots. He reveled in telling the story. The next one is very interesting, Thomas Massey Massey. You see, note the way he has played with the names there. And he was very dour. There were Puritans, you know, and Puritans are people who live with the constant suspicion that somebody somewhere might be enjoying themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, and someday the Puritan house didn't bear thinking. You know? mm -hmm. But um, Thomas Massey Massey was in the Irish uh, House of Parliament, and this is in the, the records of the Irish House of Parliament, 1780. He stood up in the Irish House of Parliament and he put forward a proposal that the word mass, they didn't like the mass, be removed from the words Christmas and Michaelmas and replaced with the word tide. So that henceforth these religious days could be known as Christide and Michaeltide. And the whole thing collapsed in uproarious laughter when another person got up and said, why would the honourable member confine himself to Christmas and Michaelmas. Would he not consider removing the term mass from his own name and replacing it with the word tide so that henceforth he could be known as Tom Tidy Tidy? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of it. <laughs> I could go on, there's loads of them, but this last one, Reverend <coughs> Charles Massey and Lord Hepburn. Charles Massey lived in Dunas across from the Massey house in Castle Common. It's still there in ruins. And he married, he was an elderly man, white haired, this is important, white haired is important, white haired elderly man, who married a very young woman, uh, 40, 45 years his junior. He was a friend of Lord Hetford, who used to regularly visit, who was also an elderly man with white hair. Um, one Sunday, when the Reverend Massey was out giving service in just different churches, the wife eloped with Lord Hepburn. Now that coincided with the introduction by Parliament of a brand new offence, which was called criminal conversation. And criminal conversation was having it off with someone else's wife. And the first case of criminal conversation it was Lord Massey, or Charles, Reverend Charles Massey versus Lord Hedford. You can go into the National Library and you can read the transcript of that case and it's as good as a novel. It's page and paper. But in the middle of it, Massey's uh, lawyer stood up and pointed at uh, Hedford with his white hair and said, this hoary old veteran whose white-capped peak, like Mount Etna, belied the fires that lay beneath. <laughs> anyway, 1804, Massey won his case and was awarded 10,000 pounds. Now you need an awful lot of knots to translate that into present money. Lord Hertford walked out and said there was no problem he had an income of 40,000 a year from his tenants. So you can see the root of the eventual thing. They had to be got out, you know, in time. So there are just four instances there. Anyway, the third Barton Massey, he had, had bought the house in Castle Connell and that became their seat, uh, eight and a half thousand acres. His son pulled off the same old trick as uh, the second Baron. He married an heiress. He married Luke White's daughter. Luke White was the richest man in Ireland. And Luke White, it was said, he was one of these people, everything he touched turned to money. And he owned land all over Ireland. He owned Lutra's Town, Castle, he owned Garden Park, e everywhere. And he bought, at that time, Kilkey was owned by the Connollys of Castle Town House and it was a deer park. They didn't live there, it was a deer park. 
They built um, a hunting lodge on the top of the mountain and realized almost as quickly as they built it that this was a bloody daft idea. <laughs> and uh, after about 10 years, they pulled out of it and they built another uh, hunting lodge at the bottom, which is now referred to as Killigy House, but it's not Killigy House, and it was a restaurant at one stage. Mm -hmm. uh, it became the steward's house of the Massey Estate. But it was built in 1765 as uh, the hunting lodge of the colonies. So Luke White bought 3,000 acres of all that land of the colony, and he built a house on it. Now, as I said, his daughter, there she is, Matilda, she married the fourth Baron Massey. So she's down in Limerick now in the Hermitage with the fourth Baron Massey. There's Luke White there. When Luke White died, he left Killikey and the 3,000 acres. Beautiful. He built the house there, Luke White. Um, Massey Woods is, is the only place where you can still see the, um, the military road in its original state. When the military road was built around 1800, it came up from Stocking Lane, which gets its name from the fact that when they were setting off through the mountains, different contingents of military would come together, the infantry, the supplies, the cavalry, and so on, and they would stock up in this lane, which became known as Stocking Lane. There's nothing to do with socks. <laughs> Stocking Lane. And they would hit off up past where the Mary Plowboy is now and veer off around by where Crua Cemetery is and up through what was then um, uh, the Connolly uh, Deer Park. And the Connollys had no problem with that because they didn't live there. Okay? But when Luke White came in, he didn't want this bloody military road running in front of his house. So he told them to shift off course up and they wouldn't. But he had loads of money. He was like um, your man O'Brien, plenty of money for court cases. <laughs> and uh, he took a court case, took three years, but he won. With the result that the road, military road, moved from going through Massey's up to where it is now. And that's why when you come through the roundabout of Valley Bowden, for the military road, you have to take the right and the left. Mm -hmm. You're with me, those who know that. And you say, why is that? Because originally it went straight yeah. up through Rockbrook. But when Luke White won his case, but had to move over. And the original military road became the main avenue into his house. <coughs> and it's there in its original state. He left that and the 3,000 acres. There's the only picture of the inside of that house. Opulent. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, he left that to his son Samuel and his wife Anne Salisbury. She was huge into gardens. And it was she who developed the gardens in Killikey. There's the front lawn. The, the, the ruin of the fountain is still there. Um, there's the house, the fountain here, Neptune on the fountain. There's the gardens, what's called the Pleasure Garden, and the Richard Turner Curvilinear uh, Conservatories. And some years later, when I was looking for something else, in the Irish Architectural Archive, I found the drawing that Richard Turner had submitted to the Whites to get the job for the, for the Conservatives. And that's the actual drawing he submitted. It, it was beautiful. When you go back, these were all fountains and lily ponds and so on. It's all dereliction now, of course. <coughs> now, I'll just go back and finish off on that. They had no children. <coughs> and when uh, Luke, Sam, when Samuel White died, he left the house for a lifetime to the wife and thence to his sister, who was now Lady Massey. Now in those days, a woman couldn't own the land in her own right. So Killikey House and 3,000 acres became the property of Lord Massey, of the fourth Baron Massey. Fell into a true marriage. Now, Luke White had another son, Luke White Jr. And he left him Larian House 
in Kinloch and 20,000 acres. And that's on the Drowes River, D-R-O-W-E-S, which even today is one of the finest salmon rivers in Europe. And the, the first salmon in Ireland, nine times out of ten, is caught on the Drowes River. And you pay big money to fish on the Drowes River. And when Luke Jr. died, he left Lareen and 20,000 acres to the masses. So they now have four mansions and 34,000 acres of land. Now, when I wrote the first edition of the book, this is the second edition, that house had burned down in the 1930s accidentally. So it was the only one of the houses I didn't have a photograph of. And myself and my wife were on a break up in Donegal. And coming back, I said, I just want to detour for something. And she said, where are you going to ask for She said, oh, it's going to do the mass. Oh. <laughs> we arrived in there, no house, you see. But all the outbuildings were there. And all the outbuildings are turned into cottages for fishermen from all over the world. Very expensive. And the business. The Masseys have no business acumen if they have. Anyway, we went into a local calf in Kinloch. And fish and chip, that was much. And there was an old man over there, she was sitting there. And I said, I talked to him. Oh, I said, no, 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 I talked to him. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And um, I said, did you ever know anything about the house? Or, or? Well, he said there was a hotel once in this village. And on the cover of the menu, there was a picture of that house. And he said, well, it's closed down, he said, now since the 60s. There's no woman lives up the mountains there. And she was a waitress when she was young girl and, and maybe. So anyway, this went to the second printing and uh, just before the printer pushed the button, a brown envelope came in my door and I opened it and was little note, sorry about the delay, sir. And here was the menu with the picture. And I ran down to the and I said, you start, no, he says, you're starting today. Have you a space anywhere in that book? He said, there's a space at the bottom of that page. I said, put that house on. <laughs> so there, you, you never know. You never know. And uh, that's the only picture in existence of Larry in house. Now, I'm a mine of useless information. <laughs> so the fourth Baron Massey had married uh, Matilda White. And he died young in his 40s. And the title went to his son at nine years of age, Hugh Hammond, the fifth Baron Massey. And he inherited the whole lot at nine years of age. And uh, he was a rich man at that stage, but he was only nine years of age. So effectively, the mother uh, ran the estate. Now, that coincided with the famine and um, there's nothing negative about them in the famine. She just seems to have been <coughs> totally immersed in her children and so on. Although there is a branch of the Masseys, the Massey Dawsons. When they married out, they added the same Massey Beresford, Massey Dawson. And the Massey Dawsons were notorious in the famine. And they cleared the entire village of Tumabara. And there's a book like that, The Clearance of Tumabara. And uh, they come out very bad out of it. But it's not this main line. <coughs> now, unfortunately, that young lad also died young. <coughs> and now the title passed to his brother. So, for the first time, instead of going down father son, it's now gone to a brother. So, for the first time, Lord Massey is not called Hugh. They were all called Hugh Hammond which goes back to the, the Normandy. This fellow is John Thomas. And there he is. He inherited on the death of his brother at uh, 38 years of age, 34,000 acres, four big houses, and uh, 39 by Catholic. And this guy loved being alone. He just loved it. It all opened up for him. Unfortunately for his family, he lived another 41 years, and we'll see why. 
No. So it, this is it at the peak. A very, very rich man and so on. Now, how did it all decline? The first little change in the late 1870s, 1880, land agitation began. Uh, Michael Davitt, who was joined by Parnell. Uh, Davitt looked after the kind of in the field, uh, a bit like um, Martin McGuinness, and um, Parnell, like Jerry Adams, looked after the politics. Whatever. And uh, so this land agitation began, where people were saying, look, we're not having any of this, we're sick paying rent, so all kinds of agitation began. Lord Massey used to allow uh, local gentry and so on to use Massey Lodge for shooting and hunting. And the locals besieged Massey Lodge and held it for a fortnight and stopped them getting out. And a big detachment of cavalry had to be sent in uh, to get them out of the house. Now that frightened Lord Massey. Um, he had no particular interest in politics. When his obituary was printed in the Irish Times, he was this and that, he was a gentleman, but there was an, a line which I thought was telling, he made no particular contribution to national life. He was neither my arse nor my You know, shooting and fishing. Shooting and fishing. And uh, so now, you might have double agitating on the ground and causing all kinds of ructions. You have Parnell, when the Active Union came in, they got 80 <coughs> seats. Instead of having their own parliament, they got 80 seats in the British House of Commons. But they were all individual seats. There was no party. They just, there was, you know, and a lot of them were gentry. And uh, there was no cohesion. So Parnell started to form a party. And he started to put forward nationalist people to get elected. With the result that he got the balance of power between the Whigs and the Tories. Neither of them had a majority. And the government would be formed by whichever one Parnell and his Nationalist Party went with. So he extracted whatever he could. And the fellow he worked on was Gladstone, who had a social conscience. So in return for support, he insisted on land acts. Now they went through various uh, developments. The first land act, you would advance two thirds of the price if you were the tenant. You got two thirds of the price as a loan from the British government at 5% interest over 35 years. Now that meant you still had to come up with one third. And what the price was, was not fixed. So that wasn't a great success. So the second Land Act, they now fixed the price at 14 times the annual rent. Okay? And you would get three quarters of the price, a little advance on this one, at 5% over 35 years. Not too many took that up. Then you have 1885, 17 times the annual rent, three quarters of the price at 4% over 49 years. There's a bit of a pick up there now, people coming forward. 1887, 17 times the annual rent, the full price as a loan. First time we've got the full price at 4% over 49 years. And they were beginning to, to move down because the landlords needed money. There was no great money in agriculture. And there was a constant hassle getting the bloody rent out of these tenants. And they just wanted to get on with partying and shooting and all the rest of it. And uh, the one that really kicked it was the Wyndham Land Act in 1903. Both sides were queuing up, scrambling over each other. 18 times the rent, plus a 12% bonus from the British government if you did it without any hassle, and the full price at 3% over 68 years. You can imagine the queues. <laughs> now, we talk about 1916 and we talk about the War of Independence. This was the greatest revolution in Irish history. That the whole lot changed over to the tenants. And the landlords were going mad to sell because tenants were a hassle, you know, and so on. Now, they ended up 
very rich, but it was a false richness. It's as if you gave up your job and your income for a lump sum of money. But you are going to have to live off that lump sum for the rest of you. And if you get a big house with servants and this and that and the other, and if you're a large master with four big houses and servants, and nobody in your family had worked in 400 years, <laughs> it was a false prosperity. And it was only a matter of time before the whole thing came tumbling down around you. Now there was a final one which is not that you know all these labourers' cottages were the equivalent kind of council cottages. There was a final one where the labourers said, hey, what about us? And they were got the the right to purchase their, their cottages. No estate cottages and so on. So that was how it all came about. Now Lord Massey only had an interest in shooting and fishing and parties. And tenants were a nuisance. So he sold in the 1881 and 1885. Now, the mistake he made was that he sold too early. He didn't get what he got down here. And he, he was a youngish man and was going to have to live off that. They knew nothing about economics. The only thing they knew to do with money was spend. And a lot of them went out, particularly after the Wyndham Land Act, and bought limousines, cars, did up the houses, extended the houses. They just didn't work at all uh, out. <coughs> now there's the six Baron Massey with Cornel Charles Guinness. That's the Guinness is up there in Tobraton. Some of you know the woman who's there at the moment, Selina. She wrote a book, The Crocodile at the Door, there in the last few years. Uh, but that's Cornel uh, Guinness. Uh, his son married his daughter. And that's where many of the photographs have come from. Now I just point out some. See how well dressed he is. Well, I found a lot of photographs of Lord Massey, and he's never in the same clothes twice, like the Queen. You know, you'd wonder if the Queen where do all the bloody hats go? <laughs> same hat is never worn twice. But never. anyway, there he's always well, impeccably dressed. Now there's the four mansions: Hermitage, Killikey, Massey Lodge, and Larry. and he kept them all going with staff. And he now only had the domain, which was a small bit of land around it. And unlike some landlords, he never worked the land. You know, it's just in the land. <coughs> there he is again with one of his daughters. See the, the cut of him there now? He didn't get that in guns. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a shooting party, either coming or going at Killikey, all being unloaded there. And there's another one. People would come and they would spend four or five days there shooting. He would spend the shooting season in Killikey and the fishing season in Heritage. And um, Massey Lodge, he went there occasionally, but he would allow others to go for shooting parties. Larry and he rented out to a family called Blacker. Now there's another shooting party. Look at the cut of him again here now. And he always had his staff impeccably dressed. Look at the coachman there. It's a shooting big. That's in the, the stables up there. You know where the, the what they call Killikey House is now, it's not there. That's in the stable yard there. There he is again. And look at the cut of this one again. I mean, the whole fleet of these shooting breaks. See that one there? I'll tell you about him now in a minute. There they are up on Crua Mountain, and that's the Braddon Mountain there at the back. Great life, isn't it? <laughs> now, here he is in older age here. But see how well dressed the gamekeeper is. That's Somerville. And they live in a cottage up on the Crewe Road, which is still there, and the family are still there. <coughs> and they were Scottish. The gamekeepers always came from abroad. I'm a Protestant because you certainly couldn't trust an Irish man to look after your game. You know? <laughs> and that was Somerville. He relied very heavily on him. This is Lord Massey here. He's been quite an old man there now. This is Lord Concurry. <coughs> now, Lord Concurry, I have christened the original Have Gone Will Travel. Because I have looked at hundreds of photographs in the National Library Archive of uh, Ascendancy. And people are still identifying who's who in these photographs. But 
there's loads of shooting parties, and in almost every one of them, Lord Clancurry is there. And he seems to have done nothing else but shoot all over the country. Now his estate was Lyons, which Tony Ryan, remember Tony Ryan? Yeah. That, was, that was the Cloncurry estate, and he bought it from the Cloncurry family, and uh, that, that's in Kildare, and it was a fine estate, and of course uh, Tony Ryan spent millions on it. Now he was the bane of chambermaids, <laughs> not for the reason now you might think, <laughs> but you see that beard? <laughs> well he dyed that beard mauve, and everywhere he went, he left a trail of mauve bedding. And they dreaded the sight of him. And everything you read about him, people refer to the mauve beard. Don't know what he died of. Now, I bring people walking around Massey's, and I can bring them to that exact spot. Uh, that, that would be either the start or the end of a shooting party. And then he had a magnificent feature. If you went on a shooting uh, party in Lord Massey's, after the shooting party, you dined al fresco in the woods. And the tables would all be laid out with the best china and silver, and all the waiters would come up and the butler and so on. And uh, there they are there. And the girls would come up, maybe they'd meet a man. And see these little pony carts? He had a fleet of them for bringing up the food. And the food would be packed at, at kept hot in straw bales and all the china would come up and so on. Can you see the money disappearing? Mm -hmm. Then there was house parties. There you are now. The Town, the, the horse show, any school town. Mm -hmm. Now there's the house in Hermitage. So during the shooting season he was in Kilkee, and then the fishing season, the whole lot would move like Fawcett Circus. <laughs> from Killikey down to the Hermitage. And the whole army of servants go ahead and get it all lighting and so on. And um, there's the house and there's the shop. And in those days it was pre Ardna Crusher which destroyed the, the Shannon for salmon. But in those days this was the fishing place for salmon and it was said that in the season you could cross the Shannon at Lord Massey's by walking on the backs of the salmon. Now you couldn't, but it looked like you couldn't. And there they are out fishing on the Shannon there. <coughs> now, look at that fish. <laughs> Such a fish doesn't exist. Yes, it's but what really tickles me is look at the cut of the poor devil in his tongue. Yeah. Fish he didn't get much of it unless he licked his tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that some fish? No. Then, in his 70s, he's now got the land back money and so on. And in his 70s, when most people would find it too tired to go out the door, he discovered cars. And he bought a fleet of cars to bring his friends off shooting and all that and he bought a nice limo for himself. And that's outside that Kiliki house now, just there where you go into Massey Woods. Again, look at the chauffeur. And there he is there. And then he got a marvellous idea. Unique among the ascendancy. He said, all this thing with fleet of cars being guys at the Federation, it's all very messy. So he bought a Sharbank. <laughs> Now that's 1909. Can you imagine that going over the feather beds in 1909? <laughs> and the ropers are cut and they're tough. Whatever. And there he is there. Come on up and take a trip in my shower. Can you see the money going? Now he had one son and three daughters. And he fell out with the son for three, for one reason. I don't know what the reason was. I couldn't track down what the reason was. But he fell out with the son. And in the various records, he, the son doesn't feature in a lot of the shooting parties. And the son married a lady called Ellen Ida Wise, who would be known today as a bit of a bitch. <laughs> it says, she caused disruption and upset, and Lord Massey, the elder Lord Massey, couldn't stand her. And their estate was down in Tipperary in Ardfin, and the son 
lived down in the house on their estate in Ardfinn. So there seemed to be a big divide there. Now, I also discovered that the son became a bankrupt. I couldn't discover why, because the papers saying why were burned by the IRA in 1922 in the four courts, called the smoke. So, and nobody down there could remember other than that he had gone uh, bankrupt. And that um, his wife was not liked down there by anybody down there. And even today they remember the name. Now, I, tra I tracked her relatives, uh, her, her grandnies, and I rang up one day and I said, You're the, the grandnies of Lady Massey, Ellen I said, Oh, yes, she said. And she, she wasn't liked in this house, you know. <laughs> oh, my grandmother, any time she came, everything of value had to be put away because as sure as God, something was missing. Her. <laughs> she went. They were down on the rockers, but they were living at Lord and so on. Now, at that stage, I had discovered Ellen Ida Wise's will. Now, I later discovered it was all, but at that stage, it looked like she had left 30,000 pounds. And I said, well, I found her will. And I said, amongst the other things, she left £30,000. This was back in 1924, she left. And on the phone, she said, did she know the bitch? <laughs> I said, she did. And who got that? She said. I said, I'm not quite sure. Oh, she says, if my mother was here now, she would love to hear all this. And, but I said, I'm on the trail. And she says, uh, do you think you'll find out? What did I find out all right? <laughs> you must come to tea, she said. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did eventually, she later, but I had bad news for her. <laughs> anyway, there he is now at the peak, all dickied up for the coronation of Edward VII. So this is him at his absolute peak. He, in, he got an interview for his um, 75th birthday at uh, the Irish Times and he forecast that there would be civil war. He got that bit right, but he thought it would be between unionists and nationalists. And so we weren't having any of that, we'd have it between ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so he got it half right. He died on the 28th of November 1915 and uh, this church in Castle Connell uh, All Saints Church. The Masseys paid for the building of that. The inside of that church, if you're ever in Castle Connell, is a wash with Massey memorials. The whole church is a wash with Massey memorials, and he's buried in this vault out in the churchyard, along with his mother, Matilda, Matilda White, and his grandson. We'll come to that uh, later. And um, <coughs> i just give you a little bit before I go on to his will, a, a kind of how powerful they were. Do you see this little adjunct here? But this was a balcony sticking out the side of the church, still there. And uh, it looked out into the church. But it was at the side of the church, you see, at the altar here, and so on. Now, that was the Lord's balcony. And uh, Church of Ireland, people went to the church, and then the masses would come down, and their carriage would stop at the door here. Now, there would be servants down beforehand. The balcony was carpeted with armchairs. There was fire going and rugs and so on. And Lord, all the, 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 the congregation would be waiting. The minute they come up the stairs, the congregation would stand up. Lord Massey would come to the edge of the balcony and do this. And when he sat down, they all sat down. Okay? Now, at the end, they sing the last hymn and stay standing. It was a great trip for me to give the talk in that church where I was able to point this out. Because they knew the name, didn't know the history. And Lord Massey would come to the front of the back, at the side thing, and nod. The family would go out, drink the carriage and gone, and nobody moved until the carriage was gone. Now there was a vicar there, and um, although he was pure, strict, they weren't overly religious in the religious sense. They just were conventional. They followed, like a lot of people today, they went through the ritual. But anyway, this new vicar, the sermons were getting longer and longer. <laughs> so he had them up to tea. And he told them this wasn't on, he had things to do. 
Um, and you might as well, I'm very sorry, my Lord, but once I start, I get carried away. My Lord, my Lord, you, you want to restrain yourself and watch your time. Yes, my Lord. So about three weeks later, and it's still there today, a clock appeared about that <laughs> on the end wall, opposite the pulpit. And to this day, that's known as the Lord's clock. And that would be called taking the hint now. So anyway, he's buried there. So after he died, there's his son, the man who was down in our film with Ellen Idlewise. The will was read. Now I believe that the fact that he was estranged from his son cleared his conscience. Just like we would worry about our children. But it cleared his conscience. The son had gone in with a woman and all the rest of it. Because when the will was read, not only was all the land act money gone, and he got the equivalent in today's terms of about 13 million for the land. So over about uh, 35 years he had blown that with all the houses and so on. But all the houses were mortgaged. So they were bust at that stage. So he never moved into the, any of the massy houses. He stayed in the Iron Finnan house. There's the wife. Looks a bit of a tart. <laughs> Wouldn't like to get the wrong side of her. There she is with her two sons. This one became the eighth Lord Massey. The man, the alcoholic man, who would come to later, lived up in the cottage up there. And there's the house in Iron Finnan where they lived. You can see one of the daughters there with someone. This would have been a gentleman's house. You know what I mean? Not a, a lord's, a gentleman's house. But they lived there. They started to, to live now. Started selling the contents. So they sold off the contents of Hermit. It took a week to sell it. And there was all kinds of stuff there. I had the catalogue. And you'd weep. This was uh, 1915. I mean, the prices. You'd weep if you saw it. Van Gogh's and uh, Flam and oh, nice. yeah. Anyway, so, so that kept them going for a while. They tried to sell the house, the Hermitage, but who could buy a house that size in those days? Now, the man in Art Finnan, he had three daughters and two sons. I just refer to one of them at the moment. This is Lillian Ayer Massey. Most people mistake me right Irene. They take it that that's a misspelling. Change. It's Lillian Ayer Massey. And she was a bit flighty and a bit rebellious. And that Lord Massey, the old man was dead, they didn't go near the big houses, they were down on the ruppers. But when they needed transport, he would rent a car from a family named King in Clonmel. And the Kings would send over the son driving the car. The Kings were Catholic. And one day, Lillian ran away with the king's son. But they were caught getting on the mailboat in Dunleary and brought back. But somewhere between our Finnan and a few days and up to Dunleary, a Catholic priest had married him. <laughs> okay? And Lillian had converted to Catholicism. If your mum was a Muslim, she'd have converted to Muslim. <laughs> anyway, she maintained until the day she died, and that she had been brought out to the stables and horsewhipped, and then locked up in a room upstairs. King was sent to dispatch, told to never darken the door again. The local priest and the local vicar were sent for by Lord Massey, and in the kitchen they dissolved the marriage. I mean, the pardon, but just removed all trace, no marriage, never happened. Lillian kept insisting she was getting out, and as soon as she got out, she was going to find a man. So they looked up where they had relatives, and Lillian was dispatched to Australia, to relatives in Australia. And she came back some years later, by which time everything was gone, nothing left. So she went back to Australia, and her son, Tony Massey Brown, who became a great friend of mine, uh, he said, and on the way back, she snared my misfortunate father, who was um, a, an officer on the ship. And she married him. She beguiled him and married him. But she kept up this pomposity all her life. 
and she constantly referred to Tony, who was the only child, as the child. You know, the child. And the child would be brought in at six o'clock. You know, so. Amused herself with the child for half an hour. That was gone. And she did, he said, even when they, they had a toss her life, she'd get off a train if they're going somewhere. And automatically, Porter! Porter! You know, just, it was in the. Now, you wouldn't be two minutes talking to her, but you would know that she was the Honourable Lillian Ayer Massey, the sister of Lord Massey. And um, so he had a very difficult relationship with her. When, uh, in later life, she developed cancer, and she came back to live in Kilsheelan, um, just outside Carmel. And she retired to a rented house there, and she died there. And she's buried in an unmarked grave in Kilsheelan which I found. And I had Tony, who was then in his early age, and his wife come over, and he was very, very bitter about her. And they were staying with me, and I brought him down, and he had a bunch of flowers. And I said, you need to put these flowers down, Tony, and end it. Say whatever you have to say, and walk away. So he stood, he cried, and he put the flowers down, he turned in. His wife said to me, um, he needed that all his life. It's uh, bedatum, you see. So anyway, Tony died there um, two years ago, and I had the privilege of being asked to give the eulogy at his grave uh, in England. So it's amazing how the whole thing goes around. And I'd be good friends with his wife still. So that's the woman who married for a day. Now, the man in Art Finnan, he had two sons, and one of them, Hugh Hammond, uh, was in line for the title. And there he is at Killikey, sorry, on his 21st birthday. Now he was sent to Harrow to school. He loved his grandfather, the man who blew all the money. He had an indifferent relationship with his father in Finnan, but loved the grandfather. And when he was home from school in Harrow, he would stay with the grandfather. Unfortunately, he became an alcoholic at a very young age, and the butler in Killikey is blamed for that, because the grandfather doted on it, but didn't keep an eye close enough eye on it, and uh, the butler was pouring the, the wine into him. So, uh, he is the son of the man in Ardfin. Now, he took up residence in Killikey House. The father would go near Killikey House, and he was there. Now, they also sold the contents of Killikey House. So he was living more or less in an empty house. And because he was an alcoholic, he would be taken in now and again into Mercer's Hospital to try out. And while he was there, he met this woman, Margaret Morton. And she was a young widow with three children under five, and uh, she was the widow of a doctor in Mercer's. So he used his charm in her, he was a very handsome fella. And he, she was Catholic. And he then announced to his parents that he was going to marry her. But they were Puritan all their life. Puritan, Protestant, and so on. And they told him that if he married her, they would never speak to him again. He did, and they didn't. <laughs> so he's up in Killikey with Margaret Morden and his wife. His mother and father are down in Ardfinan, and they're all on their uppers. <laughs> they sold off the contents of Killikey in two dollops there. So now he's in a house with no furniture. And Margaret Morden had three young children, and between them they had another child, Huey. The War of Independence came along, and uh, the next thing is the big house in Limerick goes up on fire. And I traced the reason it went on fire. Things were very bad down in Munster because the IRA are very strong in Munster. And there was a little article that size in the Limerick leader that said reinforcements were being shipped in from England into Limerick and they would be billeted in Lord Massey's mansion in Castle Connell. And the IRA said he will like. <coughs> and up went the house and it took over a week for the house to burn. So now the house is gone. Now the 30,000, Lady Massey, the husband was useless. The husband had taken a drink at this stage in Arthur She took a case against the Limerick County Council for the burning of her house. Now, the Limerick County Council at that stage had a Sinn Féin majority. 
And there was no way that those that set her on fire were going to pay for it. They told her to put her off. <laughs> so she took a court case and she won the court case and she got a garnish she against the Great Southern Railways. Now a garnish she is, you owe me money, okay? But I can't get it out of you. But I discover that he owes you money. So instead of him paying you, I get a garnish which means he gives the money to me. So she got a garnish against the Great Southern Railways for outstanding rates and costs and so on. And uh, she was awarded the £30,000. Now it just coincided with the first uh, Anglo-Irish Treaty where the Free State came in and the British went out. And part of the terms so she was awarded this under the British courts, okay? But within two months, we now had the free state. And part of the terms of the um, first Anglo-Irish agreement is that the incoming administration had no responsibility for any liabilities incurred by the outgoing administration. So she got nothing. So I was able to tell the one in the Wise family that the thirty thousand pounds was in her mind. It didn't exist. And it must have been very, very hard, you know, but on a human level. But anyway, there's the house went up in smoke. So your man is up in Killikey, the son of the man who's in our Finnan, and he's living with his new wife, Margaret Morgan and so on. There was an intruder in the house and he shot the intruder. The local fella. Now you can imagine what that did to his popularity. Now, okay, he got off because he said it was self-defense, he was defending his wife and children, which he probably was. So now you have Ellen Ida Wise, the woman in our opinion. The money's all gone, the, 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 the father-in-law has blown her all, her mortgage, everything's sold. Poor fella has taken to the drink. Her son is an alcoholic, living with a Catholic up in Kilikey who already has three children. Now I bet you even today, if your 29 year old son came in, and let's say you're a Protestant now, or a Catholic or whatever, and he told you that he was going to marry a widow with three children. And by the way, she's a Catholic. In those days, it was just out. So as far as Lady Ellen Ida was concerned, it had all gone wrong. There was no way out. And then, in her early 50s, suddenly she dies. Now you could reach all kinds of conclusions, but I've no evidence, categorically, but she dies. Maybe she'd had enough to hold. And in those days, their, their kind of public image would have been very important to them. So, the husband is now an alcoholic in our opinion. The son is up here in an empty house, and they all owe a bloody fortune. And they owe a fortune to uh, the Provincial Bank of Ireland, who say, we have enough of this now, neither of these are going to ever cough up the money. So on the 15th of May, Hammond, the son, and Margaret Morgan and the children are evicted from Killikey House. They arrived up with the bailiffs. He took to his bed and said he was not a well man. And they sent in a doctor who came out and said, well, other than the fact that he's footless, He's okay. So they went in and he made a grand statement. He had a beautiful Harrow accent. He was educated in Harrow. And he said, I shall not be leaving this house until the day I'm carried out. And they said, right, my lord. And they lifted up the mattress <laughs> down the avenue. And you know the gate into Timber Troll? Yeah. On the road. Yeah. To the astonishment of the locals. Now the foxes who lived in the steward's house took her and the children in. None of them would have anything got to do with him. So he stayed with friends somewhere. The locals did plead that you can't leave them like this and so on. So a little three-roomed cottage, gate lodge, was unoccupied on the estate. Mud floor, no running water, no indoor toilets. And they were given that. And he spent the next 38 years of his life as an in that little cottage. 
uh, at these times it's women who face reality. I mean, he, he, nobody in the family had worked for, for 400 years. The thought never occurred to him. Uh, she rolled up her sleeves. She went down, got the 47 Boston Rock Brook. She went into town and got a job in the Irish sweepstake, mixing the tickets. An ordinary job where she was known as Mrs. Massey. And she was greatly respected. And she came back there every evening and walked the two and a half mile up from Rock Brook, up through Massey Woods and up to the cottage. And at weekends and Saturdays and Sundays, she put tables and chairs out there and sold uh, teas, coffees and scones to hikers. And I know some very old hikers who can remember getting tea and coffee from Mrs. Massey. He never showed himself at all. He spent 38 years wandering around that woods. Um, whatever. <laughs> now, now his father dies down in uh, Ardfinu. Um, when the revenue went in to see what they could get to report, the revenue report, which I read in the National Archives, so there's every bit of timber in the house, banister stairs have been taken down and used as firewood. He was living in penury and he's buried in an unmarked pauper's grave in Ardfin. There's the lad up in Killity, he was a handsome man, you know. Uh, John O'Kelly, who's the matriarch up there in, in O'Kelly's, John knew them well and as a teenager, she used to go down and help Mrs. Massey and so on. And I said to Joan, how would you describe him? Oh, Frank, she said, he had the most beautiful accent, this horrible accent. And he'd love it if you said, my lord, to him. Mm -hmm. And he'd be going around in this old French coat, which was worth money at one stage, but was now in tatters. And he'd lift the hat and he'd say, good morning, ma'am, and so on. And he'd love to, if you said, good day, my lord. So he said, he was gentle, he was ever so soft spoken, she said, and feckin' useless. <laughs> you know, so, he used to give interviews, and she was furious at this. He'd go down to what's now the Merry Plowboy, Doherty's, and people would buy him a drink, and so on. And there he is with the old trench coat. And he'd, he'd talk about their affairs, like, you know, and how poor they were, and so on. At one stage, some relative left him £3,000. It's in one of them. And he said, I can't remember the man. But I'm jolly glad he remembered me. <laughs> so there you are up there. There's the house in its last days. And a woman came to me at one talk and said, Is that Killity House? I said, It is. And I researched it. The roof is gone. In 1941, having maintained the house, the bank, from 1924 to 41, the bank maintained the house and a caretaker. And they gave up in 41, nobody bought the house. And, um, they sold it to one of these salvage merchants for the, the tiles, the, the slates, which were Welsh slates, the timbers, oak, the stairs, everything was all cleared out, and then he demolished it. So just before he demolished it, everything of value was gone. And this is 1941. So that's, I traced it, that's the LDF, Dad's Army. <laughs> uh, during the war, men enlisted for the local defence force because the, the professional soldiers were off too. And they were trained, God help us, to defend the country against the Germans if they ever landed, or indeed the British. So this is the LDF kind of practicing and developing. And you see, half of them only have wooden rifles, if you look at it. But you see the Captain Mannering there, see him there in the middle. But you know who he is? He's Captain Watkins' father. Oh. And he, 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 they lived in Sarit, and he has a little revolver, so he's like the man in Gazan. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's an interesting paragraph to people turn. I, I recognised the house immediately. I said, now, John O'Kelly said to me, Frank, he'd come stumbling up from Doherty's, and he'd sit down drunk, and he had a saying, he'd keep repeating. I said, if you ever remember it, write it down, which he did. And it was, ah, Johnny, if those trees could speak and those mountains could see, many a tale you would hear. There he is at the various stages of his life, and you can see the decline. There. There he is with his son, Huey. Now, what happened to children after they were evicted? The three Morden children were taken by the Morden family. Her first husband, 
Christians, family, and they were reared by the Mormons. Her own child, Huey, lived with them until 1941, when he was 21, and he joined the British Army. Now, if he had told the British who he was, he'd be made an officer. But he never said who he was, and he served throughout the Second World War as a private. And he met a nurse of Irish extraction, and they, uh, after the war, went to live in Leicester in England. But he would occasionally visit the father, and there they are outside the cottage. Um, there. <coughs> now, the next thing is, the alcoholic man, after 38 years in the cottage, dies. He hit the front page of the press. <laughs> because he was a character at that stage. Everybody knew him to see and so on. And he said that I desired to be buried in the family vault in the graveyard attached to Castle Connell Parish Church in the county of Limerick, and I desired that the funeral service be held in that church. She half did it. She had been ostracized by the family because she was Catholic. None of them ever spoke to her. And um, he was neither, no religion and so on. So, she held a funeral service in Rockfarnham Catholic Church and she buried him in the family vault. She sold up the little cottage and she went over to live with her son Huey and her grandchildren, Huey's children who are now in their sixties, tell me that she lived for another seven years and spoke not one word about the past and told them not to go there, never to visit it, they weren't liked it was another world, lived their lives over here. And they knew next to nothing about the whole thing until one of them answered a phone call from me. <laughs> and they were very, very cagey. I told them it was serious research. I sent over the draft of what I had to date. And uh, Paul, who was the second eldest, was in my living room the following week. And for the first time, they were getting the story in. Mm -hmm. There's Margaret Moran. She was the heroine of the thing. God knows what would have happened to him for the 38 years. There's the son, Huey, a lovely man. I then went over to visit him, and I got an artist friend of mine through rummaging with John O'Kelly. I found an old slate from the big house, dubbed in a ditch, and I found an old slate from the cottage. And on the slate from the big house, I got a painting of Killikey House, and on the other one, I got a painting of uh, the Little Lodge. And I went over and I gave him that. And the daughter, Sheila, she brought me to Huey's grave. And uh, she said to me, I decided to give him in debt what he was denied in life. And I decided then, that's the end of it. That's where it ended. Huey buried in England. The right hand of the Lord Massey, Huey, to the astonishment of the neighbours, you can imagine, <laughs> when he came out. And then when the book was launched, there's David, according to Lord Massey, that you were saying to me before, about about eight years ago, I gave a talk in Knock Line, and uh, I had the pleasure at the end of it, when they all it, to introduce David Massey. And they couldn't believe it. Lord and they were all there with their cameras, and they probably still have the photographs, I don't know. So that's David getting the first copy of the book, and the people down in Limerick presented them with a drawing of Massey Lodge. And I would be very good friends with David today, and uh, he comes over here and I go over there, and an ordinary working lad. But there you are, that's how you have 24,000 acres and four mansions and blow the whole bloody lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> something to them, but what meant far more to them was that when I met them in England, they had two photographs. They had one of Killikey House, and they had one of the, the sixth baron in his robes that had come down. See, when the hermitage burned, everything was gone. And as a result of my research, on the evening of the launch of the book, and you can have a look at it here, up, I was able to give them a photograph album of over 250 photographs and portraits of their family over the last 400 years. Mm. And that really meant something to mm. So there. Mm.
what's the story today with Kilkee yeah, House? Nothing there. Nothing. nothing it's just absolutely nothing. No. Okay. There's houses built over. Okay. Mm. You come in the little driveway <coughs> off Kilkee Road. Yes. Even though the little barrier there now. Yeah. Where's the house? It was just in the left there. Was it? Yeah. Now what I have done, and I'm doing it constantly, and I have two groups next to it and so on. Now when I give talks, I say to people, I'm the only one to photograph, I'm the only one knows where everything is. Yeah. I'm quite happy at any time to meet you up there, and I don't do money, you know, I just yeah. and bring you around and show you everything. The health. And I had a group there a while back who wanted me to do it, a group of women, and I said, yes, but I have no car that day, so you'll have to pick me up, you see. So they picked me up, and as I was going out to drive, one of them says to my wife, I hope he doesn't mind. And she says, she goes around there talking to himself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy, I'm happy to do that anytime. It's a nice walk. Yeah, so nice, so I do it regularly now, half an Yeah, hour. well, I can show you all of that. And the walled garden, you know, when you go right around yeah, and you do yeah. the loop around the What's that wall there? Is that the old that garden? That's the one I showed you there. Yeah. Um, I recognise it, yeah. Hold on a minute now. And the little ice house is still Just there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that wasn't the main ice house. The main ice house is somewhere else. That was only for the shooting parties. Because that wouldn't be big enough for the house, you know. There is a big ice house up at the reservoir. Do you know where the reservoir is? Yeah. 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 Well, besides the reservoir. Right, there's the there is it. Uh, Look, there's only the walls there. Now. <coughs> you normally, um, you normally come into it. You turn right me into the wall. You do, yeah. yeah. And that, those conservatories were demolished by the citizenry of Dublin, pane by pane, with stone, and then carted away. Do you dare say they were paying money? What year was the glass houses there? Then? Well, the glass houses were built by the whites. I think it's around 1880 that the whites got that. And it was there from the 50s or something, was it? It was there um, when the state took the the bank took over the house. The state took over the woods. The state didn't care about conservatories, no interest whatsoever. <coughs> so between 1924 and I used to go up there in the 1950s and there was no trace of the conservatories in the 1950s. But somewhere in the 20s and 30s. Is but there any link between those and the Massies who are involved in the funeral business? Well, they have to go to Cheshire. All right. They've already asked. <laughs> <laughs> if you have an E in the name, yeah. they go to Cheshire. Right. Well, this, family, this family, you have to have no E. Why? And not even the people who are planning to do the divil and all up at the Hellfire Club know that. Because when I went up to the stadium, I pointed out their booklet, they had the name spelt wrong, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, that tells a lot about the research. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I've already written my thoughts to them. You've got to break it down into... Massey Woods and the Hellfire Club deserves to be opened up in terms of walks and um, uh, signposting and the trees marked and so on, and probably toilets up near the car park and so on. Um, when you go up along the river in Massey's, there's marvellous cascades and waterfalls there. You can't see them with the laurel. So the whole lot needs to be cleaned out and made into it. But what is proposed is totally over the top for that end of it. Now, if you want a visitor centre for the northern end of the Dublin Wicklow Mountains, and the problem here is that this is not based on geography, what's planned. It's based on local authority areas. But the place that's standing out a mile for a visitor and information centre is the Glen Cree Centre. Yeah where everything is there, toilets, right. yeah. cafes, space, buildings, but they won't go there because it's not in the Dublin South area. It's about a mile beyond the, beyond the border. <laughs> but that, if, you're, if it was based purely on logic yeah. and geography, there's no doubt whatsoever. The minimum of intrusion, 
uh, a historic building standing there waiting for work, but they won't do that. They're going to ravage the whole side of that mountain unnecessarily. It can't handle the traffic to start at weekends as it is. Yeah. How is it going to handle more? I was at the um the, the talk or the exhibition in yeah. the town stadium down, and when she said three hundred car parking spaces, I, I could I couldn't believe it. They've lost. Absolutely. It's not it's been driven by something <coughs> other. Somebody's ego. Anyway, a lot of water to flow under that bridge. Just where do they get the money for the conservatives? From the rent you were paying and your ancestors were paying. Mm -hmm. They don't just cost years. They were taking in thousands a year, you know. All these landlords. So they have to go, that's why they're gone. Well, at the time I thought they said they didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. Oh, they have when they did, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. That was that white. Oh, that was back in the 1800s. It was Luke White's song. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they were mega rich. Mega rich. Seems to be a very common story, though, doesn't it? With the, oh, yeah. you know, the landed gentry who come in, so one of them happen. gets it started, the other becomes an alcoholic, yeah. the next one sort of becomes a very real conservative. Well, so would you if you saw the money disappeared out the door? And, the <laughs> and a phrase that tickles me, it says, is the elderly Lord Emily had the misfortune to live into his 90s <coughs> and moved from room to room as the rain came in. Oh, yeah. And that was his end. A very sad end. But you see, the other view you take is that what goes around comes around. Yeah. 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 But on a human level, it was very hard for the last generation yeah. of each of those families. Yeah. On a human level. It's like that, um, that book, Crocodile at My Door, oh, yeah. one of the Guinnesses. Yeah, but they're still okay. <coughs> mm. They're still okay up there. They still have the land and they still have the house. Um, but no, it was very, very hard. Now, most of them managed the soft landing insofar as they got their children educated and they're now doctors and lawyers and you recognise the names. Yeah, yeah. The masses imploded. But in the space of a week, when the sixth baron died, they thought they were mega rich and straight into penny. You mentioned that the Cromwellians kept impeccable records. Yes. Is the records of the, the land that the Massey family took yes. over originally? Yes, of all the land. And when I spoke down in Limerick, I was able to tell them who got turfed out. The Cromwellian records are there in uh, the National Archives. And it's probably the same ones of the original. You can tell exactly. Yeah. And wh where do you get access to them? Uh, from the the National Archives. In Dublin. Yeah. yeah. They're not available online though, you have to go into the air. Oh, no. No. Yeah. Um, no, you went to the National Archives. And I'm putting hours and hours. Based all their wills, you know. It took me, um, it took me about two months to find out when the house in uh, Limerick was born, the Castle Connell house, because burning the houses was nothing, it was ten a penny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, having looked through the Times and the others, I then realised this would only be local uh, info. Mm -hmm. So I found it eventually in the Limerick League, that size, Lord Massey's house barn. And I spent months and I went out and I bought a a, 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 latte, a latte and a cream cake. <laughs> <laughs> Many years of research. Three years. Three years. Fantastic. I did a more recent one, which is out there on um, uh, J.B. Malone. You know, the, oh, yeah. 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 He, he wrote over 900 articles on hill walking and hikes and so on over 36 years. Uh, from 1930 something up to 1950, and um, uh, for his 25th anniversary of his death, these articles were lost. So I was decided to publish a book, reference all the articles, and in my innocence I volunteered. And over um, six months, I read over 10,000 editions of the Evening Herald, <laughs> and found all the articles, and they're now out there. In the <laughs> 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 <laughs>